to episode 161 of the Cricket Her Weekly. Apologies for being a little bit croaky this week. I've picked up a cold from somewhere, possibly even at the Wisdom Dinner, Sid, because it's been a special week this week because we were both able to go to the Wisdom Dinner to celebrate the release of this year's almanac. The 160th edition, it says that on the side. Do you want to turn around so people can see the side? There you go. Um, yeah, so it was it was a great dinner. It was your first Wisdom dinner, Sid. Did you enjoy it? It was. It was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Um, I, I haven't got to go in the past. I've contributed to the past five Wisdoms, but um, contrary to popular belief, it's not every contributor gets to go to the dinner, sadly. But I was on the reserve list this year. I was 12th man and <laughs> I got called up at the last minute. So that was it was really nice. Great. Um, and who and, did you sit next to? Uh, so I sit, sat next to Rory Dollar, whose work you you may not you may not know his name, but you've almost certainly read his work because he works for PA. So um, as an agency, they tend to remain nameless. So, you, but you may well have read his copy um, in any number of other publications, for anything from the BBC to the Times. He might end up writing for. So yeah, I sat next to him and had a long conversation about left wing politics. He makes no secret of the fact on Twitter that he's uh, a man of the left. So that was a really interesting conversation. Who did you sit next to, Raf? Well, I was also sat next to a man of the left, um, Nicholas Lazard, who writes a column in the oh, New Statesman. Oh, in the Statesman. New Statesman, yeah. Yeah, and um, he was delighted that I read his column um, and actually said that he was going to write his column this week about wisdom, and indeed he has. He did, didn't he? I did not get a mention, so... <laughs> <laughs> Very disappointing. And, and and what was the dress code for the for the wisdom dinner, Raf? <laughs> it, was, it was black tie. And what did Nicholas Lazard turn he, up in? To be fair, wearing an MCC tie which is normally a perfectly acceptable <laughs> form of dress for the long run anyway I mean, let him in. yeah <laughs> and who else did we meet uh, I, I, met, I met a bloke called Tom who'd come all the way from Holland Raff. <laughs> that's a terrible joke I didn't tish. you mean no Sid you met Tom Holland the famous historian who's also a, a keen and famous cricket cricketer. lover and does a bit of cricket writing yeah no it was great to meet him as well so yeah. someone I hadn't met before Good. Um, and obviously there's always, every year, there's the Leading Woman Cricketer in the World Award. And uh, who won that, Raf? It was Beth Mooney. And who wrote year. about Beth Mooney in this in this year's wisdom? <laughs> I better check on the back. I did. Oh, yes. <laughs> one Raf Nicholson. So I got to interview her okay. um, a couple of months back, which is always fun because um, I think I, I said this on previous podcasts. You have to basically say to them, congratulations, you've won an award, but you're not allowed to tell anyone for several months. Um, so yeah, I, I got to chat to her and she was lovely and um, very modest as she always is about her many achievements last year across, um, you know, various, uh, well, the World Cup and the Commonwealth Games um, and just lots of lots and lots of runs scored. So that was nice to write about. And she already started well this year, of course, a contender for next year's award as well. Perhaps. Well, yes. Yeah. And then she'd be the first woman ever to win it three times because she's already won it twice. So anyway, we'll, we'll have to see. We shouldn't get ahead of ourselves. Um, there's plenty more of the year to go. So, yeah, no, but that was that was nice. And then the other thing is obviously to see whether there will be any women in the Wisdom Five. Which is um, which is always for the five players who have most stood out across the English summer, and um, so were there any women in it, Sid? And there were. So Harman Preet made the cut this year, and I think think a great choice. Um, the the, the Wisden Five is very much in the gift of the editor. Mm. So you know, that, and that's always been the case. You know, through 160 editions, the, the cricketers of the year have been chosen by the editor. Um, and so, you know, there's always like a lot of debate about, you know, should this person have been picked, should this person have been picked. The other big thing is you can't be picked more than once. So once yeah. you've been picked as part of the Wisdom Five, you'll never get picked again. Yeah. Um, Lots and of people don't seem to understand that. <laughs> yeah, some, sometimes it's it's kind of, you know, it's almost, you can see that it's kind of been given for sort of, you know, long performances over yeah. over, over many years, in fact, even though it's, it's really supposed to be sort of about the impact on the English summer. But, but sometimes, you know, performances in past years do kind of come into play. I think that has a little bit with Harman Preet. Obviously, you know, played uh, what I think is the, the greatest individual performance of all time uh, back at Derby in 2017. Mm. Um, but, you know, had a, had a very important summer last summer as well in England. Um, she scored that big innings at Canterbury. Um, you know, probably we'd be talking about that as her greatest innings if it wasn't for the, the Derby innings, I yeah. think, wouldn't we? It was a, just yeah. a, a colossus of an innings. Yeah. Um, and, of course, just, you know, generally led India to, to victory in an ODI series. The first, the first overseas team, apart from Australia, to um, win an ODI series in England for donkey's years. 
um, you know, and someone that's, you know, very much deserving of, you know, a kind of a place on, you know, one of cricket's plinths, if you like. So, yeah, uh, I'm very happy for her. And there's a great piece written by uh, Corinna in the in, in the magazine or in the, sorry, in the, yeah, in the book about which her. She describes Harmon Britt having um, successfully navigated Le Fair, Fair Mancad. Yeah, she described. It's a Karenia, brilliant Karenia description. got to keep the word Mancad in there. I, I, wrote a, I wrote about the England India series and the word Mancad was replaced with run out backing up at the non-striker's end. That, but that's, a little because, bit of a that's because Corinna put it in French. She yeah, said, she so. said Le Faire Mancade. Anyway, so, and we have a bonus. Piece. We now know what the French for Mancade is. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. So so plenty of women in the Almanac. Um, there's obviously your pieces um, about some of the domestic stuff. Yeah. Um, so I wrote about the RHF trophy and the Charlotte Edwards Cup. So, you know, look out for those. And Raf, you wrote about the, f the first Women's World Cup, even though that didn't take place this year. Why, why, are they, why, <laughs> why did you end up writing about the first Women's World Cup well, it was the... when that is not the World Cup that took place last year? Um, well, just, just to uh, be totally clear, it was the first ever Cricket World Cup, not the first Women's World Cup. So as I always say, we should really refer to them as the World Cup and the Men's World Cup because ours came first. Um, and a few years ago, there was an ICC consultation about changing the the way in which they described the World Cups, and they actually gave me a ring, uh, gave me a ring, and said, "What do you think?" And I genuinely said this, and the woman laughed at me because she thought I was joking, but I wasn't. <laughs> uh, we should really be referring to them as the World Cup and the Men's World Cup. Anyway, um, it is 50 years since the first Cricket World Cup, um, and it was obviously a big risk, a big gamble. Cricket never had a World Cup. Many sports have never had a World Cup. So it's about that gamble that this group of women took um, to try and get a bit more exposure for women's cricket and has obviously been quite successful in the sense of, you know, you can't really imagine the cricket calendar now, men's or women's, without a World Cup. So well done to Rachel Hayo Flynn and all of those women who were involved. And it's also a little bit about, isn't it, kind of correcting the things of the past in terms of wisdom and correcting the record of the past. Because one of the things that, that Lawrence Booth is trying to do in his tenure as editor is kind of make up for some of the omissions of the past because the World Cup yeah. wasn't given a big billing in wisdom the, when it actually happened, was it, Ralph? No, it's amazing looking back. Um, so you read, it, it was the 1974 edition because obviously the, the year of the almanac covers the preceding calendar year. Um, so if you look in the 1974 almanac, it basically has like it's it gets one page of coverage on page a thousand or something. And then in the the really galling thing is a couple of years later, when the men finally get around to having a World Cup, Wisdom described it as the first cricket World Cup. And I, I was I was I did some proper research for the piece and I was sat there reading this. And I was practically like punching the desk because I was so cross and frustrated. Um, about this factual inaccuracy. Anyway, so yeah, you're right. That it is partly about correcting the record, and Lawrence Booth has been very progressive in that regard as an editor. Yeah, absolutely. And I was reading also. I was reading the obituary section, Raf. And actually, as a man, it's quite worrying because reading the obituary section, it's clear that men die at a massively higher rate than women. <laughs> so I was, I was a bit concerned about that. But someone suggested to me that perhaps that was didn't tell the whole story either. <laughs> <laughs> but they are. But the serious point is that they are also trying to correct their record on obituaries, aren't they? And yeah, they are. Uh, more obituaries uh, of women. They're kind of uh, how do you term posthumously yeah. re-obituarising. Yeah, so it's women. being it's being described as the women who wisdom forgot. Um, and so every year they have a an extended obituary of somebody who died quite a long time ago, who at the time that they died either had no obituary in wisdom or had a very short obituary in wisdom. Um, and so they're, yeah, they're recognising the achievements of some of these women. Yeah, including uh, this year, Queen Victoria. Um, oh. So we've got obituaries for both okay. both our late Queen, Queen Elizabeth and Queen Victoria. Wow. Um, who had some quite, quite limited association <laughs> with cricket. Yeah, I mean, in previous editions, they've done people like, I think they did um, Frances Heron Maxwell, who was the first um, chair of the Women's Cricket Association. Um, I'm trying to think who else they did. I think they might have done Marjorie Pollard one year, who had a very short obituary. Um, so yeah, it's 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 great to see. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Right, Sid. Well, yesterday, the cricket season officially started. The cricket season proper began. <laughs> there was there's been some, but a little bit, little bit of the, that, the other cricket, but um, yeah. Yeah, so, so we had the first Rachel round Hayo of flinting. Yeah, we had the first round of Rachel Hayo Flint fixtures. So we had four games. Um, one of them was curtailed by rain, but they all basically 
went ahead. So that's exciting. Um, now, the big drama of the day, and this was the, the match that, that we were watching, was Vipers v Sunrisers. And I'm, I'm sorry to say, Sid, um, it didn't go the way that you would have hoped because Sunrisers actually beat Vipers. And not only did they beat Vipers, they beat them by 126 runs, which is a very big margin um, and as I tweeted if you'd been if you'd been betting um, on who Sunrisers were going to finally break their RHF drought to because that's the first ever match they've won in um, the Rachel Hayhoe Flint Trophy then you would not have got very uh, good odds on it being against Vipers so there you go what went wrong for Vipers Sid? Well I think uh, I, I, mm. I want to give a lot of credit to Sunrisers here, actually. Yeah. Let's, let's start talking about Sunrisers okay. um, before we talk about Vipers. Um, because, you know, I kind of made a tweet. So they, were, they played another warm-up game last week, and Grace Scrivens absolutely dominated, just mm. scored 100 runs. No one else got out of, um, got out of single figures. Uh, she also took four wickets. And um, she, I was kind of gave, they made this tweet that it's basically like, it's a, bit, a little bit of a one-woman team. And I'll hold my hands up. I made that, made that tweet. And, and I didn't quite say it, but, you know, if you, if you knew, you knew. <laughs> but what they did was prove that, that, that you know, yesterday they weren't a one-woman yeah. team. Um, so, you know, Grace Scrivens um, was important at the top of the order. She was perhaps a little bit fortunate not to be given out off Lauren Bell. It didn't really look as if, you know, either Lauren Bell removed, removed the ball an extraordinary amount after it had pitched or there was a, there was a bit of a nick. Um, but it wasn't given out. She took advantage of that um, and, you know, she scored 60-odd runs. Uh, but, you know, Jodie Grucott played a really important innings. Um, first of all, yeah. she just stayed there. Yeah. Um, so Lissy McLeod got out early because basically Lissy called for a run and um, Grace Griffins was like, no, I'm the best <laughs> player here. I am not running for that and getting myself run out. Yeah. So Lissy, Lissy got stranded. Um, but, you know, Jodie Grucott, you know, just, just stayed there and she played a long innings. She, she played a lot of dot balls. Um, you know, and she kind of grew into it and she, you know, ground her way to, to a 50 as well. Yeah. Um, and because that they had a bit of a platform, that also meant that Maddie Villiers could come in at the end and actually not come in, you know, with impending disaster, but come in with, you know, an actual chance to kind of break, break free a little bit and not to worry too much mm -hmm. because there weren't so many wickets down. Um, and they could throw the bat a little bit at the end and Maddie hit, you know, 70 odd at the end. Uh, and they put up a, a very decent total. And, you know, it was a total that was always going to gonna challenge the Vipers. Um, and, the you know, the Vipers came out, you know, and did, did, did they bat their best? Well, no, but, you know, there was also some good bowling. And uh, Abta Maxud in particular, yeah. um, you know, she bowled really well. I mean, she's not, you know, she's not Amelia Kerr. She's not going to turn the ball a mile. Um, but she was getting a little bit of turn, you know, away from the right-handers. Um, but what she was was doing really well and you know really consistently was attacking the leg stump and that led to you know definitely a couple of the wickets um, you know so the the final wicket that she took which was Mary Taylor I think um, you know she bowled a ball you know kind of on leg stump and it kind of t didn't turn but it kind of squared up and went on to hit leg stump you know it was a, it was a proper bowler's wicket. Uh, Georgia Adams, she, you know, she was attacked because she was attacking the leg stump. Georgia Adams ended up having to play a shot when, you know, she probably didn't want to. And you know, actually with this particular ball, it would have gone up, it would have hit her pad and it would not have been given out. But Adams felt that she had to play it because the balls were attacking leg stump. She just wound up playing a defensive shot. All these, mo these modern bats are great when, you know, you kind of can ping the ball to the boundary. But one thing about these modern bats is if you ping it a little way, you can ping it a bit too far. And that's what happened to Georgia Adams there. Um, yeah, so great performance from Abtomak Sud as well. You know, were Vipers on top of their game? Mm, not really, in, in, in very many ways. Uh, Lauren Bell was restricted from bowling. She only yeah, got to can bowl I five say overs. something about that, yeah, please? Well, because um, it's actually incredibly frustrating that um, you know, a couple of days before the RHF, the ECB put out a press release that said, oh, by the way, these are the players who are available, the England players who are available, and only half of them are available. Now, we don't know the individual circumstances around that, um, but, but you know, we, so we don't know whether it's the ECB saying we don't want you to play um, or whether it's the individual players saying, oh, actually, I'm a bit tired. But it seems a bit poor, whichever of those it is, because we're right at the start of the season. Um, and, you know, a lot of these players haven't had very much cricket recently and they're not going to have very much cricket ahead of the Ashes, competitive cricket, I mean. Um, and so to actually 
sort of either for them to turn down playing for their regional team or for the ECB to say, oh no, we don't think it's a good idea. I'm not happy with either of those scenarios. And then obviously Lauren, somebody like Lauren Bell, keen to play for Vipers, wants to play, wants to show what she can do. And I guess, you know, really kind of stake her claim for the Ashes as well. Um, is then told, oh no, you can only bowl five overs. Well, isn't the next round of fixtures a week away? So that that's just bizarre because you, so you're saying that you know one of your leading bowlers who you want in a in a couple of months' time to go and be playing and, in a test. So you're playing in a five day test. You're saying, oh no, we think you know you're only capable of bowling five overs in a week. That's insane, <laughs> and that really, I have to say, that really um, was very restrictive for Vipers. Um, it was. It made life very difficult for them. It meant that they ended up bowling a lot of spin, um, and you know it kind of added to the fact that actually one of the issues for Vipers, I think, is that they've let a couple of really, really solid players go. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure of the kind of you know inner wranglings that have happened, but basically, um, Tara Norris has gone off. Um, and Paige Schofield has gone off. We will talk about Paige a bit more in a minute. She had a very good day yesterday. Two, they were also missing Emily players, Windsor as well. They were, through injury. But um, So that's not really Vipers' fault. But they've let two players go who are very solid, middle order batters, who have definitely dug them out of many a hole over the last couple of seasons because Vipers have been in difficult situations with the bat where they've been four or five down and struggling and one of those two players has really helped dig them out and those two players are also kind of solid mid medium pace bowlers which Vipers were also really missing yesterday so I think in hindsight that looks like a huge mistake to have let both of them go. Yeah and you know we, we said a couple of weeks ago that the Vipers were putting some faith in some younger players and <clears throat> You know, ultimately, you know, that's the kind of thing that you hope will pay off. But, you know, at the moment, you know, Mary Taylor, you know, is still there's still very much a work in progress, for example. And she's she's not an, really an immediate an immediate replacement mm -hmm. for Tyra Norris, for yeah. example. And, you know, putting, putting a lot of pressure on those players, especially when some, we have to find an extra five overs because Lauren Bell can't, you know, can't bowl exactly. those, those additional yeah. five overs. So that does does make it. A little bit harder for them but again you know let's let's take nothing away from Sunrise's performance they're a great result for them well I think if we're talking about moves as well one other thing that I want to highlight is Eva Gray I think because she's obviously moved over from the stars to Sunrise's I think that's a, that's a really solid buy and one that's perhaps slightly gone under the radar a bit but she um yesterday I thought she bowled really well um, you know, very solid for them, kind of had, you know, if Vipers has had Eva Grey, then things might have been different, actually. Um, and she also, I think she hit like 25 or 15 balls or something at the end of the Sunrisers innings, when it looked like they might finish up on more like 250, and they ended up making nearly 290. Um, and, you know, there's an enormous difference between those two scores. So I think she was really important with the bat as well. So for Sunrisers, that's a really good acquisition. And, and suddenly, you know, Sunrisers are looking like a, a really, a really decent outfit. It's, it's a bit confusing, Sid. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're Sunrisers, your key worry is that Grace Crivens does now get picked for England yeah. and, you know, winds up missing a lot of regional games as a result of that. You yeah. know? But, you know, if she, if she doesn't get that, get that England selection this summer, um, then you know, looking good for them. So what about the other results, Raf? Yeah, okay. Um, well, just do a quick roundup of what happened elsewhere. Um, so a couple of the other games went much more kind of to form. So Stars um, were pretty dominant in their game against Thunder. They made over 300 um, and beat Thunder very easily. Um, Diamonds, who are obviously reigning champions in the RHF, um, e easily beat Storm. Um, that was the game that had a delayed start, so it was reduced to 30 36, something overs. 36 overs mm -hmm. aside. Um, but yeah, so they, they beat Storm pretty pretty easily. Um, your your girl, Bess Heath, or <laughs> the, the, you know, you've obviously backed Bess Heath quite a lot. She had a good game. 71 off 38, Sid. Yeah, she did. And it's kind of what, what's, what, what's, what I really feel about this one is just to re emphasise again, then, the, the fact because she didn't keep wicket yesterday. Lauren uh, Winfield, Lauren Winfield Hill kept wicket for, for the Diamonds. And I totally accept that from the Diamonds' perspective, you know, that's that's the best option. She's the best wicket keeper. But I just really feel that Best Heath's England prospect will be so much more enhanced if she was keeping wicket regularly. Um, and, you know, I'll bang on about it, but if she'd moved over the winter, mm. then she'd have had the opportunity to, if she'd moved to Vipers, she'd almost certainly been in the team and keeping wicket for Vipers. Um, you know, and 
it's not necessarily to say that Bess Heath, you know, can't go on and have an England career and she might still go on and, you know, be England wicketkeeper. And even if she doesn't keep wicket, she's going to still have an England career. But her chances of playing for England and playing for England for a long time and winning, you know, 100 caps or whatever will be much enhanced if, you know, she was able to, to keep wicket on a regular basis. And she's only going to get to that point if she gets more games behind the sticks. So, you know, that's kind of disappointing. And I'm not I'm not calling for, you know, the ECB to totally intervene in the regional setup and to start, you know, individually picking sides. But it is a pity that nudges weren't given in, in, in that case. And of course, as I've also banged on about in the case of Grace Scrivens being, you know, Sunrisers captain, which hasn't happened this year either. So, um, yeah. but but still, you know, great news for Bess Heath. And you know, let's hope that she gets a chance to keep wicket, um, you know, later in the summer. Okay, um, and, and then the last of the four fixtures um, that we haven't mentioned yet was Blaze against Spock. So it was Blaze's first ever game, um, ended in a blaze of glory. <laughs> no, they beat Sparks by 59 runs, um, despite having not put a huge amount of runs on the board. Um, but yeah, they managed to bowl Sparks out, so good for them. Yeah, and the other person we were going to mention, of course, was Paige Gofield, yes. uh, who um, so she was one of those Vipers players that they, that they let go. She's gone to South East Stars. We've talked a lot about what can happen when players move and how players can be rejuvenated and how a different coaching setup can give them an extra edge. Um, that really seems to have happened in Paige Gofield's case. Yeah. Um, now, you went and looked up the last time Paige scored 100 in any form of cricket, and it was quite a while ago, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I, I was sat there thinking, wow, you know, first of all, um, we switched over from the Vipers game and, and we watched the, the last bit of the Stars innings. Um, I think Paige was on 80 when we turned over and then suddenly, you know, she, out of, out, she's starting to hit sixes and it was a great flourish, great flourishing end to that to that innings and it was it was amazing from she Paige. She smashed her former colleague Tara and, Norris around a bit. And I've yeah. really not seen her bat like that in years um, and I and I just thought hmm, I wonder when the last time she made a hundred so yeah I did some research and and it turns out the last time she made a hundred in any form of cricket 2013 so a decade ago and but 2013 that that season for Sussex under 17s she hit three centuries and then a couple of other like really high scores in the 80s and 90s and that was the point at which everyone was everyone in the know at Sussex was saying this girl is a kind of you know a dead cert for England um she's she's the next big thing and people getting very excited and somehow she's never quite reached that level she's never quite fulfilled that early promise and you know this is it just feels like somehow she's reverted to the Paige Schofield of 10 years ago when she was the one in the gym she was at that point you know she's the one of the only players in domestic cricket who's bashing sixes and um, and um, yeah amazing to see and what you know what star's been feeding her over the winter <laughs> I think it's a great example of the way in which yeah like you keep saying if you move then you can somehow get that rejuvenation in your career and let's let's hope it continues because she's a great person and it's wonderful to see her doing well yeah, it was fantastic stuff, and I'm really, really happy for. I'm really happy that the the move has, you know, already kind of worked out. I mean, if yeah. if nothing else ever happens, the move has already worked out for yeah, us. So that's exactly. awesome. Yeah. Now, the but one gutting thing... for Vipers. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sid. The one thing I wanted to finish. I want to talk a little bit about the about the crowds and things. Yeah. And the, um, so you know, there there weren't terrible crowds yesterday. Um, if you were watching the Vipers live stream, it looked it looked a lot worse than it actually was on the live stream because most of the spectators were in the one stand where the one non-fixed camera was. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't see most of the spectators. So there were more people there than it looked, but it still wasn't huge crowds. And I went back and I just wanted to have a look at, so I went to look at the hundreds of social media account because the hundred is also supposed to be about drawing people into cricket, not just making them fans of the hundred, but making them fans of cricket as a whole. Yeah. So in the hundred social media accounts, they've got 160,000 followers on Facebook. They've got 75,000 followers on Twitter. Um, and you know, Nothing. They've only tweeted about the hundred in the last couple of weeks. There's been no tweets whatsoever. And it, I'm not suggesting that the hundred Twitter. At least it's a delicate balance. And I'm not suggesting that the hundred Twitter account should be tweeting five times a day about the RHF or even five times a week. But just one tweet, one Facebook post, going, "Come and see your hundred stars before they play in the hundred. Um, you know, and something to kind of you because you've built up these big so and this has cost you a lot of money, ECB. You've spent a lot of money on you know marketing and effectively mm. buying these followers, not literally buying them, but you know you put them, you put in the marketing money in order to get these followers on on Facebook and social media. They definitely spent a lot of money on social media uh, paid promotions. So you know the the things that made the hundred 
appear initially in your feed so that you clicked follow. They've built up all these followers and now they're not using them. And if they could just make a little bit of use of them, that would be great and might see you know even more people come through the doors to, to support these teams. Well, I think it really chimes with the research that we did at Bournemouth University, um, which suggested a couple of things in relation to the 100. The first one is that many people are going to the 100 but are not then transferring that interest into other formats of cricket. So you're getting increased interest in women's cricket, but those people aren't then going, oh, I'll go and watch some women's domestic cricket. And the other thing is perhaps, you know, how joined up is the bit of the ECB that's running the 100 with the rest of the ECB? Because this is a, a great case of, well, the, the ECB 100 Twitter account might think, well, that's not really anything to do with me. But actually, as a, you know, strategically as an organisation, you do want to be cross pollinating between competitions because isn't that kind of the whole point in a yeah. way? Um, so yeah, and and we you know we have seen traditionally that even though regional cricket is a great standard and, and provides some really exciting encounters, um, you know it hasn't been getting crowds of anything even remotely approaching what the hundred gets, and and that's a bit disappointing really. So I totally agree with what you're saying. Okay, thanks. <laughs> right, let's wrap up. Um, we will see you in a week's time when we might actually be out watching some live cricket. Sid could be interesting but bye for now bye